welcome to this primary election debate for Democratic candidates for Maricopa County Sheriff. This debate is sponsored by Clean Elections, the state's nonpartisan voter education agency. My name is Mari Rabago, and I'm joined by Steve Goldstein, who will be co-moderating today's debate. The format for this debate will probably be familiar to you. By the way, we're sharing this debate as part of a brand new effort to support democracy in Arizona. Thanks to a partnership with the Clean Elections Commission and the Arizona Media Association, we're working to make sure these 2024 debates are the most accessible in Arizona history. That means this conversation will air on a long list of local TV stations, radio stations, and digital platforms, including support from local newspapers. It's a shared effort among hundreds of local media brands across Arizona. That is correct, Steve, and transparency is critical here. That's why this debate has been designed with input from a broad group of journalists in Arizona representing urban and rural communities. And we are trying to keep the rules very simple. Each candidate will have two minutes to make an opening statement and one minute for a closing statement. Candidates have draw straws to determine the order. Throughout the debate, Mari and I will pose questions to each candidate, allow them to answer, and then make sure the other candidate has a chance to respond. Whenever a question is directed to a specific candidate, only that candidate's microphone will be open. At all other times, every microphone will be open. Thank you to voters across Arizona who have submitted questions. We've reviewed all of them to make sure every voice is heard. However, neither candidate has been given advanced access to any of the questions. And with that, let's introduce our candidates for this debate, Tyler Andrew Camp, and Russ Skinner. That's correct. So, Mr. Skinner, you have the first opening statement and you have two minutes. Well, thank you to the Clean Elections Campaign for inviting me to be participating in today's uh, debate. I certainly appreciate that and that opportunity to be here today. Being the current sheriff for Maricopa County with 34 years of experience with the agency and second generation, I know the staff, I know the community, and I know our challenges and where we excel. We've been through a lot. Uh, through administrations. This is my fourth administration serving as the sheriff, and I really enjoy working with the community that we built upon. We went through some challenges with the Melendrez Court Order, and that's one thing that's unique with the sheriff's office to have federal oversight. A jail system, the fourth largest jail system in the United States of America, serving over 7,000 inmates on a daily population, 80,000 being booked into the jail. So when you look at who's going to run the sheriff's office in this next term, I hope that people do their research and look to me I do have the integrity, accountability, and ensure that we continue with progressive measures and efforts to ensure that we're training up to, up to speed, we're doing 21st century policing, and doing it in a constitutional manner. We will continue these efforts as I continue to go forward and make sure that we also work on our recruitment retention issues, as well as some of the issues that we have involving um, other programs, uh, the inmate services programs, and to ensure that our educational programs to make sure that school safety is a paramount issue that we take upon us. Uh, additionally, we're dealing with a, a election campaign right now, but we're also dealing with election security, and that's paramount. As we continue to talk about seconds. and we see what's going on, we want to make sure that we provide that security and education out there so that our community and the public is safe. Thank you. Tyler Andrew Camp, you have two minutes for your opening statement. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Russ. Great to see you again. You know, I've always been somebody who wants to help others, serve a purpose greater than myself. It's why I became a cop at age 22. It's why I teach at my youth at my church for the past 15 years. It's why I've traveled to eight countries around the world serving in humanitarian organizations. It's also why I volunteer my time working for foster care organizations as well as food pantries here locally. We all know the dangers of a sheriff who puts his political beliefs before the needs of the community resulting in discrimination of people of color and a federal lawsuit that has cost the county taxpayers upwards of $300 million in counting. When the Democratic Party reached out to me to run for sheriff, I was honored, but I felt the need to earn the support of the people. So for the past five months, I've traveled the county attending nearly 200 meetings and events, meeting with folks and listening to them. I've been overwhelmed and humbled by the amount of support I've received from people from all walks of life. But more importantly than that, I have the unconditional support of my wife, my family, and my close friends. I have over two decades of experience with the Phoenix Police Department. Over half that time was spent investigating organized crime, criminal street gangs, and homicides. I have 10 years of public safety leadership experience. I have executive experience 
living overseas, working for the largest anti-slavery organization in the world, fighting human trafficking. I also have executive experience working with local nonprofits here in Arizona. I am the only candidate with a diverse background and proven track record to be the difference maker the county needs. I will build upon the success of Sheriff and Zone and move the Sheriff's Office forward with integrity, accountability, and effective policing. Thank you, Mr. Kemp. And Mr. Skinner, we'll start with the first question, okay? You were gonna have two minutes to answer. 11 years ago, following a long lawsuit, MCO so was ordered to stop racial profiling of Latinos here in the Maricopa County and have that overseen by a court monitor also. There are still concerns and also complaints within the community about whether MCSO has stopped those practices. What reforms have been successful in your opinion? You have two minutes. Yes, we've had lots of reforms that have been successful. In fact, both in the first and second court order were 100% compliant in phase one, which means the policy and training has been delivered. In phase two compliance, making sure that that is actually being carried out on the street, we're over 90% compliant in both phases. So those reforms are lasting. There's continued compliance, substantial compliance with those efforts, especially over the past seven years as working with Paul Penzone as the chief deputy. One of the paramount issues we were working on is to ensure that that court order, those reforms, and those compliance measures were up to where they need to be. I was one of the first lieutenants that actually was assigned to the court implementation division in October of 2013. So I'm very aware of all the issues involving the court orders as well as the supplemental court orders. We have made substantial gain, we have gained substantial compliance and substantive reform that we'll be dealing with uh, that even if the court order goes away, those reforms are going to be lasting within the agency as needed to be able to be progressive in our policing in 21st century to ensure constitutional rights of our public and our community are upheld. Secondly, with that, we have a recent annual traffic study. This is post uh, traffic stop analysis report. It shows zero disparities in the Latino drivers that we have contacted over this last year, which is, shows the, the major progress that has been made, as well as the other issues in the third court order of the backlog of PSB investigations. We've went from 2,100 to 1,400 backlog cases in a matter of several months. So we've made those and we're continuing on the path, and as the sheriff, I will continue those progressive efforts to make sure that the community continues to be served as needed and as they expected, and we will make sure that uh, we do those reforms. Thank you, Mr. Skinner. And Mr. Campbell, would you like to elaborate? What reforms do you think have been successful so far? Yes, I want to be clear about something, too. In order to fully graduate from these court orders, we must be in compliance for three years in a row. Fully compliant for three years in a row. At this moment, we have not been in compliance for one single day. Uh, and I understand it's a complex issue, but that has to change. The two most pressing issues with the court orders uh, are the backlog of uh, the backlog of uh, internal uh, employee misconduct investigations, as well as dealing with racial and ethnic disparities in traffic stops and non-traffic stops. This fractures trust with the community. It also fractures trust within the organization because uh, it, it prevents some employees from promoting or even transferring. I have an accomplished record of getting things done. And in my experience, it comes down to a couple things. One is people and process. You have to have the, the right people in place. You have to have enough people in place. You also, you also have to have the right processes. And I think uh, a more effective way we can do this is train and empower some of our frontline uh, supervisors to deal with some of the lower end uh, misconduct complaints. Uh, and also with better customer service, we can limit the amount of complaints coming in on the front end. Mr. Camp, let's go to you on this next question. In your opening statement, you referred to the amount of money that the Melendres case has cost taxpayers, many, many millions of dollars at this point. If you were in this office, what would you do to absolutely ensure this kind of thing didn't happen again? As you said, this was a very complex situation. Yes, and I think uh, Sheriff Penzone has done a great job putting us in the right direction, but there is definitely more work to do. Uh, and a lot of that comes with fostering relationships with the community. One of the things that Sheriff Penzone did was he created uh, uh, community advisory boards. These are important and that's why I have traveled the county meeting with so many different leaders uh, and stakeholders in our community fostering those relationships because when issues arise it's important that we have that open communication and dialogue to deal with some of these complaints. 
Mr. Skinner, do you have ways to ensure if you stay in this position that you can actually make these improvements and make sure, promise the county voters, this is not going to happen again. Your money will not be wasted. Yeah, absolutely. I'm one of the first ones that was involved in this court order. I know the court order back and forth, every paragraph relative to it. So as far as somebody that has the institutional knowledge, I know what was done in the past will not reoccur in the future. We've put reforms in place to make sure that they're lasting reforms, the training, the experience that is there continues to move forward. We've shown that with our substantial compliance that has been gained. The other thing is, is I've already reached out as sheriff to the community advisory board that is part of the court order to extend the communication, to invite them to be part of the participation relative to policy review, as well as other community member, member advisory boards uh, involving Latino uh, community members as well as African-American, LGBTQ plus members. And I opened up the doors because I don't want those doors to be closed. They were closed in the past. We also continue to work with other agencies to make sure that we're equipped and we provide the resources to provide public safety to our community, not just in you know the, the municipal areas, but throughout Maricopa County. That's one thing that I've been able to do as the chief deputy for Paul Zone in working over the last seven years uh, have built those relationships. And don't get me wrong, the number two within the agency drives those initiatives and drives those operations for the sheriff. So I know that. I've been on the ground level in being able to do that, and I will continue to, to move those, the needle forward with compliance so that we can start looking at remedy from the, re the reform or the oversight. But the reform will always be there. Okay. okay, Mr. Kemp, what additional reforms regarding racial profile do you think still needs to be done and take place? Yeah, again, I think it comes down to the relationships with the community. I just met with several leaders in the Hispanic community, and they've told me that even today, uh, there are many in the Latino community that are afraid to call the police uh, because they're afraid that they will be deported if the, res if the police respond. Uh, this can happen, and that is a problem, and that is a relationship issue. It's a communication issue. We cannot ensure justice for all if some in our community are not calling the police. And so continue to foster those relationships is, is important. Uh, there are also some things in place that I would continue as sheriff. Uh, the traffic stop study is, is imperative, uh, body-worn cameras. Uh, I think it's important that when complaints do arise, uh, that we take it seriously, we act swiftly, and we're transparent. We must be accountable. We must identify, is this an issue, uh, is this a lone wolf, a, a deputy that is acting on his or her own? Uh, is this a policy or a training issue? Is this systemic? It's important that we get to the bottom, we find the root of the problem, and we communicate that with our community leaders, leaders uh, and make sure that we hold ourselves accountable uh, so, that they can, so that we continue building that trust. Mr. Skinner, from your perspective, what kind of reforms are still needed and should be taken in place when it comes to racial profile in Maricopa County? Yeah, obviously we've got two big issues, and that's the PSB investigations and the backlog. We need to ensure that we get those done in a timely manner, and we've got a third order that, uh, that ensures that is being done. We have policy that the monitor team, the parties, the ACLU, DOJ, and the CAB have, have weighed in on, and we are, we are showing that movement forward. The other thing is the traffic stop data. A lot of this is post-stop traffic analysis. And to show this recent annual traffic report that it has zero disparities with Latino uh, community members, but we do see some others with the other racial. I don't know that we can ever explain it away. Some of them are minimal, like 17 minute uh, or 17 second additional stop length. That's seconds uh, in, in involving a traffic stop. So we will continue to move the, the reforms forward. We always look at use of force issues, even though we're not under court order like, you know, we have a, another agency within the Valley that's dealing with some of these issues that the DOJ report came out with. Although similar with some areas, but very different in other areas. We want to make sure that we're policing the 21st century style and that we're constitutionally doing so and moving that forward. As far as issues that still outlay, a lot of this is administrative stuff. So a lot of the court order actually has to do with just supervision, what we call an uh, employee intervention system notes. If a, if a sergeant accidentally doesn't do one or a few of them, that sample group does not get in compliance. So we lose compliance for that. These are a lot of times human errors. It's not that our staff is not doing them intentionally. It's there's a lot to be done with less resources. So we want to make sure that we continue to stay ahead of it. We have an internal Bureau of Internal Oversight that does a lot of compliance checks so we can be self-sufficient. And that's what we want to do. The, the goal of this is to make sure that the reforms stay in place and that we, can, we don't need oversight anymore. So we're working towards that goal and I'll continue to do it as sheriff. Mr. Skinner, let me stay with you on this one. Um, the idea of trust has come up. You've talked about some of the things you're doing to reach out to different communities. 
Are you still hearing, though, on a personal level? Do you talk to people at the ground level who still say to you, even if they appreciate the reforms that have been taken, they are expressing some of the fear that Mr. Camp said that they will, that they might, they, they might get deported if they come to you with a concern? Yeah, and I'll say this. Obviously, we are permanently enjoined from doing any in, uh, in immigration enforcement. We do not and will not do so. We put our, our staff through training for bias-free policing. We ensure that they have the best tools of the trade to make sure they extend that. We have a very robust community outreach program, as well as the community advisory boards that were the sheriff's office. I attend to several of these meetings, and I also go out into the community, and I have opened my door as the chief deputy and as the sheriff and asked them, give me specifics, because if so, I want to know about them so that we can correct them. Sometimes we see this involves other agencies. That I cannot control other than to be able to work with our other chiefs out there, which I'm part of the East Valley and West Valley Chiefs Association, as well as the Arizona Sheriff's Association. So we do collaborate and talk about issues that may be involving or impacting their community. But I always have an open door with our community members to ensure that they can trust their public safety. We can't do this alone. We have to continue to work together to move public safety in your community and to have the best response so that they do feel safe and that they do trust in law enforcement and we're working together to keep them safe and move the, the initiative forward. So Mr. Camp, what would you be doing then to increase the trust that you mentioned? Yeah, it starts now. It, and that's why I've traveled the county meeting uh, with, with over uh, 200 meetings and events in the past five months. It's so important. I was just meeting with a gentleman. He's part of the LGBTQ advisory board. Uh, and uh, he said he wanted to get more involved. He wanted to be more engaged. He says, what can I do? I said, you're doing it. He goes, what do you mean? I said, this right here, just getting to know me, me getting to know you, we have to build a solid foundation because you're right, it does, it does come down to trust. Uh, we, can, we can shout from the top of the mountain, but if they don't believe us, if they don't trust us, it doesn't matter. Our job is to keep the public safe, protect the community, but they also must feel safe. And uh, when you're living in the shadows, when you feel like you're living in the shadows, you feel like you're scared to go to the grocery store or the gas station, that is not a good feeling. And we have to make sure that we do better building those relationships. Mr. Skinner, a lot of people question still if the court should be involved still with the oversight of MCSO. What is your opinion in this? Well, I don't think any agency wants oversight. I mean, obviously, we see what Phoenix is going through. It's not a fun task. We did have need for reform with the office. We know what happened. We know that there was racial profiling through litigation, as well as other reforms to get into best practices. I will tell you that there was a lot of good that came out of it to give us the technology that we need to be able to track, example, body cameras, other software programs that the county budgeted and allocated to our, our agency. So there was a lot of good that came to, the, to bring us up to where we needed to be in modern day law enforcement, which has changed quite a bit over the years. And that's kind of a big thing is, you know, a lot of the candidates haven't been involved in law enforcement over the last three or four years, and we've seen our community change dramatically and be impacted dramatically. So should the court still be involved? Um, you know, I would like them not to be involved, but we also have to show that we are self-sustaining with these reforms, that there's not a need to it, for it. We are getting there with 100% compliance with the first phase on all of this. So. Um, you know, I think Mr. Camp had referred to that we haven't gotten anywhere. No, there's, there is uh, substantial compliance that actually has been shown for three consecutive years. The full and effective compliance is for the complete court order. And what I want to do is continue to work with the judge and the monitoring team and parties to see if there's certain things like we've seen in other jurisdictions of a consent decree where those can fall off. We'll still continue the process, but we focus on the meat on the bone, basically, of what issues still need to be uh, covered. And that's another important thing. This is a federal court order and not a consent decree, which are two very different things. These are mandates that have to be done. And we need to make sure that we work together, communicate together, provide that training, provide that policy to move forward to make sure that we can definitely get out from underneath the oversight, bring down the cost, and make sure that the agency is self-sustaining. Thank you. And if Mr. I could yeah. Yes, please, no, go ahead. No, I appreciate that. Uh, so he's correct. This is a court order. These are court orders, not a consent decree. It's a court order because the sheriff's office basically thumbed its nose at the courts. The courts had asked for data and information, and the sheriff's office said, nope, we're not giving it. So they were given a court order in 2013, uh, and Mr. Skinner is right. He was put in charge of complying with the court order, failed to do so. So the sheriff's office received a second court order in 2016, and then a third court order in 2022. So yes. Uh, th th this, is, this is a problem. And it, when I actually sat down and read the lawsuit and the three court orders, 
I was blown away at how dysfunctional the leadership and the training was at the sheriff's office. I think we all saw uh, uh, the roundups and the discrimination was out in public of what was going on in, in neighborhoods of color, uh, but I did, had no idea it was as dysfunctional as it was until I actually read the court orders. And so, yes, it was definitely needed, and it, and it continues to be needed until we can show that we can fully comply with it. And I want to be clear, I didn't say we haven't made any progress. What I said was we have to be in full compliance for three consecutive years. As of right now, we have not been in compliance for one day, and that needs to change. Mr. Skinner, before we go to our next formal question, do you want 30 seconds? Yes, absolutely. And again, there are almost 200, over 200 paragraphs relative to this order with subparagraphs. There are paragraphs that we are in compliance with, and some we have been in compliance with for over three years. So to say that not one day, it is the complete court order. And that's what I want to work with the federal judge, the monitor team on. Are there things that we can reconsider relative to some of those paragraphs that we have shown effective compliance and reform? Okay, let's stay with you on this next one. Should Immigration and Customs Enforcement be coming into Maricopa County Jails to check the immigration status of inmates? Does your office have any control over that? Yeah, obviously the Maricopa County Jail System serves over 23 different agencies. This, because it just has MCSO on the building itself, doesn't mean it's our facility and we can deny. That would be like telling Phoenix PD, oh, you can't bring your people in here uh, to book. We have to provide adequate space for them to process individuals, whether it be on the local municipal level, the state level, and the federal level. We offer space to the federal immigration uh, department to be able to do their job in a safe manner, effective manner, and out of the elements. So as far as that goes, we're not involved in the actual processing. Again, we're forbidden, nor would we be able to do that, or would we do that? This is just providing partnership which we all have to have in law enforcement to be able to make sure that our, our public is safe and our community is safe and give them a platform and opportunity to do their job. Those doors will remain open to our partners, both on the federal, state, and local level, so that they can do so and they can do their job efficiently and make sure that we keep our community safe. Mr. Camper, are you concerned about ICE, immigration status in the Maricopa County Jails? Yeah, and I agree with Mr. Skinner on uh, the relationship with Homeland Security and our law enforcement partners. It's important that we have good relations, not only with the community, but our law enforcement partners as well. Uh, but I want to be clear about something. I want to say we, something I will not do as sheriff. Uh, we will not engage in courtesy holds, a common practice that Joe Arpaio uh, participated in for Homeland Security. Uh, we will not hold people longer than we're constitutionally allowed to hold them. We will also not engage in uh, proactive immigration enforcement on the streets. And so I want to be clear that we will not participate uh, in any, any type of immigration enforcement like that. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'll stay with you for the next question. So to what degree do you think MCSO should be involved with immigration? Uh, like you mentioned, even checking the status of, you know, the inmates, especially because in the past, this office has been accused of neglecting the investigation of hundreds and hundreds of cases of sexual abuse on minors because being so focused on immigration enforcement. No, you're right. And that was one of the things that was exposed under Joe Arpaio's watch in the sheriff's office was they were spending so much time conducting immigration enforcement, they neglected a lot of the sexual abuse cases and some of the more serious offenses that were occurring uh, in Maricopa County. Mr. Skinner, would you like to elaborate on this? Yes, here? absolutely. Yes. And we do not do any immigration holds. We do not hold anyone longer than there to be released. We release them at the time that we get the order to release. And if, if immigration or anybody else does, can't process within that, they're released. We don't rely on if they're showing up or not. We make sure that we get them out of the jail system in time that they need to be. So secondly, we do not enforce immigration law. We will not enforce immigration law. Uh, I believe 20, uh, SB 2060 is on the books, and there's a lot of process revolved, involved in that, but that is not something we will pursue by any means. And our staff is trained in, in doing so and not doing so and making sure that our community is safe and we're providing public safety. My biggest concern is providing uh, a safe community and our services, our resources are utilized for those communities that need us. Mr. Skirn, I want to stick with you on this one. Um, going back a little bit to how you would run the office, obviously you've been there since Sheriff Penzone resigned, retired, you took over those duties, but what sort of tone do you think is important to set for the office, for the staff, the people working under you, that if you're saying right now, MCSO is not going to be involved in immigration enforcement, we don't want it involved, but what about the attitude of some of the people under you? Are you able to get it across to them that this is the tone I want to set? Yes, again, the agency is reformed from immigration enforcement. Those people are no longer there. They've been trained. If they, they, most of that staff is gone. That's an era that has gone by over a decade ago, seven years ago. What we do is we make sure that they're 
trained in constitutional policing. That is one of my main goals, is to make sure that we uphold constitutional policing. The other thing I bring to the table is I've walked shoulder to shoulder with the staff for over 34 years. I know what they've been through, the good, the bad, and the challenges. Obviously, the court order, uh, the constitutional infringements that were brought upon the agencies left a scar in our community and a scar in our agency. And the one thing I want to bring back is that bridge to make sure that people are proud to put on that uniform, continue to do their job, they're supported rightfully, as well as the community. That scar will never go away, but they know that there's a new era in this administration, and they want to make sure that we provide the services that they need. So I will continue that path that has been set right away, and I can tell you from a recruitment and a retention standpoint, knowing that a deputy sheriff is running their agency, they feel very confident. It hasn't been since 1944 that they've had somebody come up through the ranks and become a deputy sheriff. And I also uphold my whole, my whole career has been based on integrity and has never been challenged. I have been able to show accountability with staff members that have uh, you know, challenged any type of policy violation, and we will make sure that we uphold the highest degree because you're a law, we have law enforcement professionals working in this, and our community needs to continue to trust us. Mr. Campbell, what leadership tone would you set? Would you can you assure people watching right now, Maricopa County voters, that there would not be, quote unquote, bad apples under your leadership? Yeah, we are one generation removed from the Joe Arpaio era. And I think it would be a major step backwards if we elected a sheriff that worked under Arpaio for 24 years. It comes back to trust with the community once again. And uh, right, right or indifferent, uh, if the community doesn't trust uh, the, the voice of the sheriff uh, who's worked for Arpaio for 24 years, it's very difficult uh, to continue to move the sheriff's office forward. Well, let's continue with the area of Arpaio because 10 City um, got uh, garnished a worldwide news because of what the practice of that office had at the moment. What reforms or what changes do you think, Mr. Skinner, need to be done when it comes to the jails of our county? Yeah, and again, I've worked for, this is my fourth administration myself. I came in under Agno. So you take the good and the bad from the leadership that is before you. You, you learn from that. And obviously, my biggest challenge is to make sure that the scars are erased within the agency, that they're proud to put on the uniform, and that we continue to build with the community. Are there reforms? Yes. Progressively, we look at this. This county's changed dynamically. Every day, they say between two and 500 individuals move into Maricopa County. We've seen everything from protests. We've seen everything from election cycles being very different than they were in the past. So to be progressive is, is law enforcement's challenge, but we need to make sure we're on the cutting edge. And I ensure that. I make sure that we have the training, we partner with the resources and the agencies that are there, and that we also elicit the community to make sure that we're engaged in meeting their needs and expectations. We have to listen to what is needed because none of us can solve this alone. This is a community problem, and uh, you know we want to make sure the crime's down. We want to make sure that we uh, respond to any type of uh, major event or protest with according resources and that we use... Uh, definitely de deflect deflection uh, issues, as well as dealing with mental illness and the fentanyl crisis. One of the big things that I did with this budget cycle is make sure that we have um, co-responders that are clinically uh, clinical clinicians, medical clinicians, to go out and respond regionally in the communities. I've done a lot with the jail system. We're working on medical uh, electronic devices to make sure that we continue to get to them fast if there is a medical emergency. This is not like it was in the past. There's been a lot of uh, you know discussion out there. Uh, law enforcement has changed dramatically over the last five years. Our inmate population has changed dramatically. Fentanyl is hitting our street, mental illness, uh, drug trafficking, sex trafficking, and human trafficking. And we're putting measures in place, programs in place. We just worked with ASU uh, STIR grant to be able to get some educational tips out there for our staff and for our inmates. So we're working towards those goals. Mr. Camp, would a model like 10 CD be an option for you if you would win the elections for the jails in Maricopa County? Yes, but can I go back and, d and address the, the jail question? Go ahead. So, yeah, two of the biggest issues with our, our jail system currently are uh, the smuggling of drugs inside our jails, resulting in, in many overdoses. One overdose is too many. Uh, and, and secondly is, is staffing. Uh, but in relation to drugs being smuggled into the jails, uh, they typically come through intake. And whether that's through uh, an inmate or a visitor or employees, we have to revamp the intake system to make sure that these drugs are not getting smuggled in. We also must do a better job vetting uh, the employees as well as visitors that come in through intake. Now, staffing is a major concern. Uh, we are at historical lows when it comes to staffing at our jails. It's not safe for our employees, and it's not safe for inmates. And there's some things we can do to, to curb that. 
Uh, one is graduated from the court orders, but that's going to take, as we discussed, at least three years. So we have to do something in the meantime. And that's a change of cult culture. We have to recruit and retain our employees. I think with an emphasis on recruiting uh, women and our veterans, uh, these are untapped resources uh, that we can, we can, they would do a great job working inside our jails. I'd also like to introduce an employee, a walk-in employee wellness center. Uh, it's a tough job and that's a big reason why people are leaving is because it's tough. You have to work long hours, holidays, weekends. Uh, it's very stressful. And so to have a, a clinical practitioner uh, resources available for the employees, they could just walk in and, and uh, uh, be, part of, be provided with some of these resources to treat not them physically, but also their mental health. It's so important, as well as your family. And this wellness center would be open to the family as well. Uh, a healthy family life uh, means uh, an employee who's happy and can, and can provide better customer service for uh, uh, the people in the jails. Mr. Skinner, this segues well into our next question, which is what sort of training is going on for employees of Maricopa County Jails? And what would you like to see change? Are there things you've done already, but things are some of Mr. Camp's ideas, things you'd want to implement in this 21st century employment center? Well, I'll tell you this, a lot of, and again, this just goes Mr. Camp not knowing the agency as well. We do have a wellness SISM group that does work with our employees and their staff members. We have a very robust program for our inmates involving correctional health services, the REDEEM po program for our inmates that looks at cognitive change as well as um, substance abuse change. We, we do give them that program. The, the challenge with the jail system is that, you know, these are pre-sentence inmates. A lot of times they're booked in. We don't know necessarily when they're going to come out of the jail system or if they're actually remanded to the jail system, it's under a year. So we want to make sure that our, we continue the programs and we have been able to uh, provide them good opportunities for educational programs, to get them off of addiction issues, to give them the mental health and the resources once they get out. A very robust uh, reentry, rehabilitation, reentry programs, what we continue to maintain. And our employees, we continue to work on uh, benefits and compensation, one of the things I'm working with the Board of Supervisors on, as well as uh, state and even federal leadership or benefits and compensation for our detention staff and the rest of our public safety and our deputies for hopefully a step plan. We're the only agency in pretty much the United States that does not have a designated step plan, and that's one of my initiatives that I want to move forward with. And with the recruitment and retention efforts, we're providing those issues. Mr. Camp, as a follow-up to that, do you think you'd be able to get those plans implemented better than Mr. Skinner, if you two share ideas, is there some way in which your leadership you think would be more effective? Uh, yeah, I think as sheriff, your job is to inspire. It's to lead and inspire and, and cast vision. Uh, Mr. Skinner, I think, is a great operational leader, uh, but that's not what the sheriff uh, is. The sheriff is somebody who's the CEO of the organization, somebody who can inspire and, 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 prevent, and present vision. So uh, there will be things that come up that we haven't dealt with in the past, I can guarantee it. And we need somebody who has the flexibility, uh, the broad scope of experience, not just, not just in the police role, but we're learning that uh, my work uh, over broad, uh, uh, diplomacy work over blo uh, work abroad, as well as work with nonprofits is, is vital to the success of the sheriff's office because it brings a different perspective and a different uh, point of view of how to solve our, our problems with, uh, in public safety. Mr. Skinner, I want to go back with you. You mentioned about the issue of drug abuse in the streets and among inmates. Are you satisfied with the way the jails are being run right now? And especially when there are allegations of drug trafficking done, especially from officers towards the inmates. Well, let me address that. There, there was one person in the organization that attempted to bring drugs in and we infiltrated that. We do not have evidence of others trying to bring drugs or drug trafficking in our jail system. We've put in a lot of steps relative to making the jail safer. The issues we're dealing with is fentanyl. Fentanyl is a nasty drug. We work closely with correctional health services. We evaluate any type of health issue relative to that. Uh, the, the correctional health director and the doctor have actually told us that they have not seen a, a medical or health crisis like this. Let's face it, the people that a lot of times enter our jail system aren't the health, healthiest individuals, both by exposure to our elements out here as well as um, the drugs that they may be taking and at the level that they may be taken. We've done a lot of proactive steps. The first thing they get handed when they walk in the door is a bottle of Gatorade in a meal so that, that we make sure that they're, uh, they get the, the hydration back up, the nutrition. We've seen a direct impact with this. We've also put dogs in the jail to make sure, and these are your nice little Labradors, not 
not security dogs. These are dogs that actually sniff out drugs, and we've actually had some good response to that. We had an inmate get up from a chair. The dog hit on the chair. We knew the inmate actually had drugs on, on that person. So, and we also have screening for all those that enter the jail, both on the visitor side as well as our employees. And this is just to make sure it's safe. We're not, we, I trust our employees. This was something that came under Pinzone, and he and I will tell you that we disagreed right away, but it's proved to be effective. And so we're gonna to maintain to, to make sure that we keep our inmates, and mainly our staff, uh, taken care of and make sure it's a safe place and effective environment for them and eradicate that. We can only continue to mitigate contraband beyond just drugs will infiltrate anywhere in, in the U.S. And so a jail system is more secure than most, but we see it at airports where you think would be a very secure. Federal buildings, these are things that we continue to work on and be progressively responsive to. Mr. Campbell, you like to elaborate. Do you, are you satisfied? Do you think the Korean uh, jails are functioning the right way? I think they are to a certain extent, but uh, like I said before, uh, one overdose is too many. And we've seen uh, several overdoses in the, in the last few years inside our jails. Uh, drugs are clearly getting inside our jails. Uh, when I spent time investigating organized crime at the Phoenix Police Department, we did numerous investigations in the jails and the prison system, but specifically in the jails where uh, gang members were uh, sneaking drugs, smuggling drugs into the jails through, through visitation and employees. These were large-scale investigations, and so these are, these are areas that we need to continue to work on and stop. Mr. Skinner, we have invoked the name of Paul Penzone a lot tonight, but also former Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Is there still influence being felt there by Sheriff Arpaio? He was there for a very long time, cast a very large shadow. Are there certain things that viewers right now, you can say to them, he's been out of office for eight years at this point, he is no longer influential? That is correct. I will tell you this, again, I've worked for many administrations. Being second generation, I've even known administrations predating me with my father working there. I can tell you this, Joe Arpaio uh, is no longer, uh, you know, no longer being looked at as a leader in the organization, nor an influence in this organization. We still have the federal court order. Uh, you know, I don't want to say the gift that keeps on giving, but it's not in a positive light. This is something that's impacted our agency uh, greatly, and we are working hard to continue this. We've made a lot of progress. It shows in the numbers. It shows in the community um, engagement, the community involvement, shows in our response and uh, reaching out to the community. I get positive feedback on our staff and their response. Uh, we just worked with uh, several cases involving um, you know, burglaries in the areas, drugs, we work with community projects. If we see something where somebody in an abandoned house that's a, where it's used for drug trafficking or just uh, homeless uh, drug use addiction, we make sure that we work with the community to eradicate that but address it as well. I will tell you that, that those days are over and our future is here. Mr. Kemp, do you have concerns, though, that there's that, still that shadow hanging over? You mentioned some people who don't necessarily trust the MCSO. One would think that's probably because of Sheriff Arpaio's reputation. No, absolutely. And when I travel the country, uh, our pile still looms over the county. Uh, I often, when I tell people I'm from Arizona or Phoenix, they say, oh, is that the county where Sheriff Joe uh, was, was, was running for so many years? And it's, 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 a, it's a stain on our community, and it's still felt. Uh, and there's still distrust in the community. This is, this is a big deal. And uh, anybody who's been associated with Sheriff Opio in, in the eyes of many in our community, they're just never going to trust that person. Uh, and that's why it's imperative, it's imperative that... We elect somebody who has not, has not worked and has not been a part of the culture of Sheriff, Sheriff Opio. Uh, we are one generation removed from, from his era, uh, and I'm the only candidate with a diverse background and proven track record uh, to take us to that next level. Can, can I rebut to that one? Go for it. You have 30 seconds. No, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, to, to allocate that somebody that's been with the agency bears the front and same leadership style as somebody that served in the past is absolutely wrong. That would be like saying Mr. Camp here who served with Phoenix and right now we're, they're looking at a DOJ investigation impending federal degree and saying, well, he's just as guilty uh, of being part of that organization. You can't pin employees with leadership because you don't have a say. There's actually a federal law and, and uh, court uh, decisions on that. So. That's, uh, that's kind of unfair to say. Okay, I want to go back to 10 City, if it's okay, and I want a specific answer on this. Uh, do you agree with the model of 10 City? Will you implement something similar here 
in Maricopa County again? Well, this could be a short answer. Absolutely not. Um, Sheriff Penzone, when he came aboard and I worked with him on this, uh, actually hired a, well, didn't hire, actually got community members to be part of a, a review committee relative to Tent City. And when we looked at it, the bottom line was it cost the taxpayers a lot of money. The other thing is the elements. You know, we went through Hart versus Hill uh, many, many years ago, which was a lawsuit in the jail system. And we have to be progressive with the elements of what we're dealing with in Maricopa County. It gets to be 122 degrees out here. The other thing is, is between the staffing, and I want to just uh, address the staffing because Mr. Camp brought it up. Back in the day, we had almost 9,000, over 9,000 inmates. And so with that, our staffing is commensurate with 7,000 inmates. Yes, we're still understaffed, and I still have an initiative to do that. But the bottom line is we have less inmates now uh, post-COVID than we did over the years that we were talking about with the numbers. If we were fully staffed, that was for 9,000 inmates plus in our system. As far as Tent City goes, no, we don't need another facility. We just built the ITR and the Watkins Jail, which is our intake facility and holding facility, and it's direct supervision, which is, uh, you know, again, one of those things that you're actually more of an open view. We look at it as people coming into the system, might be their first time coming into jail. It's a little more, brings the anxiety down for our inmates. So we have enough facilities to be able to maintain. That would take a lot of resources and a lot of taxpayer money to put back up. And there's no reason for us to do that, not to mention to deal with the elements and everything else. It costs a lot. There was air conditioning and swamp coolers out there. So think about the electric bill on that. Mr. Kemp, what do you think about the model of 10 City? Will you implement something similar? No. And in 2016, uh, Sheriff Penzone, uh, he, he created a mini task force, uh, some community members, business leaders, to take a look at the effectiveness of Tent City. Uh, what they found was it was not effective, it was not cost effective, it did not prevent recidivism, it was not safe for employees. So I absolutely would not uh, create a Tent City again. But what I would do is with those cost savings, I would invest in equipment for the employees. I would also invest in drug treatment programs for inmates. Uh, a big part of my platform is restorative justice and preventing recidivism. Uh, treating the problem, not to, just the symptoms. It's important that we, we have a holistic approach uh, to our inmates uh, so that um, they, they can get the help they need while they're, while they're locked up in jail. And then when they leave, we're creating a pipeline for, for jobs so that they could be successful and have a place to go and they won't return to jail uh, in the near future. Mr. Camp, let's shift topics here. Recent election cycles have seen an increased number of threats against election workers. Sheriff Penzone worked closely with the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, the county recorder, to help protect workers and provide more security. How high a priority would that be for you? Uh, it would be a big priority. Uh, and Sheriff Penzone did a great job in the last couple of ele election cycles, but there has been an increase of threats, um, threats of violence, intimidation, and we cannot allow that. We have over 220 voting centers across the county. Uh, we will have anywhere from two to 3,000 part-time and full-time uh, election workers working during that time. Uh, we will have about a dozen or so drop boxes. Uh, and so the, the protection of our election system is critical uh, to our, to, for our society to thrive. Uh, and so I think it comes down to collaboration and planning. We must collaborate with uh, election officials, our uh, law enforcement partners, uh, stakeholders. We must outline clear rules of engagement, roles of responsibility for everybody involved. Uh, and we must go over emergency scenarios. Uh, let's say there's a bomb threat. What do we do and who does it? Uh, what are the distances for protesters or somebody with a gun on their hip? These are all things that need to be discussed and planned ahead of time. Uh, the goal of election security is de-escalation, the protection of our election workers, as well as the community. Mr. Scooter, how important do you think that collaboration was with the sheriff, the supervisors, the county recorder? Well, I was part of that collaboration, uh, absolutely. In fact, we continue throughout each, each month we meet in fact, more so uh, as the primary comes up each week. I've partnered with the Board of Supervisors, county leadership, our federal partners, county elections. In fact, we just did a press conference today relative to uh, election security issue in reference to one of the magnetic keys that was stolen by a, a temporary election worker. This is one of the things, Paramount, that made the decision of my appointment by the Board of Supervisors was to ensure that continuity continues. We've built a platform since 2020. Again, prior to that, there were not a lot of issues with the county elections. It was a one-day event that a lot of our staff went out and actually just spent the day out there to ensure those ballots got back to the McTech Center. That has changed dramatically since 2020. We actively communicate. In fact, I actually have a meeting coming up with city managers, county manager, and all law enforcement chiefs in the county 
coming up July 10th to discuss and continue to discuss our partnership as we deal with the, 20, uh, the 220 ballot boxes, but also the McTech Center. And we've strategically placed resources out there to allocate to that to make sure that everybody is safe and secure in that election process and dealing with the threats that may come to electeds or others involved in the election so cycle. We have a lot of volunteers that stand up this time to be able to do this, and we make sure that they're protected and they're secure and they feel safe to do so. So we will continue those efforts. It's been seamless in the continuities there. Uh, we've already, I've got a proven track record of already doing it these last two uh, cycles, and we'll continue the path, and we can progressively train together, communicate with each other, and work together to, to, to accomplish it. Staying on this topic, Mr. Skinner, do you believe the Maricopa County election workers should feel comfortable with the help they are getting from the MCOSO office, and why? Absolutely. They should feel very comfortable. We help train them. They're actually part of the collaboration that we continue to uh, work with. We, we provide training material to them. We work with elections officials to make sure that's delivered. We also give them the resources. We place uh, supervisors out there working with the election uh, staff to make sure that they have a line of communication. We set up our, our emergency operations center for them. We make sure that we also provide the security working with uh, protective services and the other agencies that are out there at the ballot locations to make sure that they get visibility and they make sure that they know what to do. And again, today's press conference showed that an immediate issue came up and the response was rapid enough that we have somebody in custody relative to potentially an election security issue where the gentleman stole a magnetic fob that actually works for one of the tabulators. So it does show that the response is working, it's proven, and we continue to work with the board, county leadership, and our, our public entities out there throughout Maricopa County to make sure they feel safe and secure and give them the tools to, to make sure we get the democracy accomplished. Because that we're, it's a zero tolerance for us. Democracy will prevail this election cycle as it will going forward. Mr. Kamm, do you believe these uh, election workers in our county have the help and the support they need? Y yes, I do. And again, I think it goes back to uh, the collaboration ahead of time. They have to feel comfortable working with law enforcement. And remember, not, not everybody in our community is, feels comfortable speaking to somebody who's in uniform. And so the only way we can break down those barriers is, is through relationships and those relationships ahead of time. And so the collaboration ahead of time, allowing them to ask questions and have that uh, open lines of communication uh, with the sheriff's office is imperative for them to feel comfortable and the election uh, and the, each voting center to be comfortable. Mr. Camp, this is a partisan position. There are some who say maybe it shouldn't be, but it is, and you're both running as Democrats. Um, Sheriff Penzone was a Republican who then became a Democrat. What should Democratic viewers right now, independent voters right now, when they see the two of you and they lean to the left, let's say, they lean to the Democratic Party, should they trust that you're a true Democrat? What would you say to them? Yeah, so for my entire career, professional career, I've never been a political person. Uh, at, when I worked the streets of Phoenix, when I conducted my investigations, it didn't matter who you are, where you come from, I'm going to protect and serve to the best of my ability. In 2021, I retired from the Phoenix Police Department, and my wife and kids, we moved uh, to Africa. And that is when uh, my vision for public safety started to evolve a little bit. I, I started to create a, a sense, a deep sense of empathy, uh, and I believe that uh, public safety is more than just arresting people. We can't arrest our people, uh, arrest our way out of crime. It just doesn't work. We have to have more of a holistic approach. So oftentimes, uh, people have uh, mental illness, uh, drug addictions. They would not have committed a crime if it weren't for those, if it was not for the mental illness and drug addiction that they have. And so. Uh, we're just going to continue to arrest people over and over again until we treat the root of the problem. And so my approach, my vision for public safety is more of a holistic approach. And so uh, back in October when Sheriff Penzone announced he was going to resign, uh, I met with the Democratic Party and I shared my vision for public safety. I shared my, uh, my professional experiences, my personal life experiences, and they were absolutely comfortable with me running as a Democrat. And they wanted to support me and do everything that they could to help me win uh, in, in November. And since then, and that's, that's the very reason why I have traveled uh, across the county uh, meeting with, uh, attending over 200 meetings and events, because it, it, it's my opinion, you must earn uh, the right to run as a Democrat, you must earn the support of the party, and I've been overwhelmed with the amount of support I've received. Mr. Skinner, how important is your political affiliation? Yes, no, there's no political, there's no 
priority with political affiliation with me. I've been in law enforcement for 34 years, and I, I show integrity and accountability with the office. I make sure that we do so in a constitutional manner and that we respond. It doesn't matter if, if one of our deputies goes out there, they do not ask you if you're a Republican, a Democrat, or independent. We truly guide with public service in mind. And my integrity and ethics are intact that that will continue to be driven as such. Political affiliation does not belong in law enforcement and should not be in law enforcement. In fact, it was one of the things that drove me to doing this, was making sure that I continued the mission of serving and not having somebody come in here for their own agenda, their own ego, or their own political affiliation to drive the mission of the law enforcement. Sheriff's Office is unique because it is an elected position, but I can tell you that my, my integrity has been never challenged, never questioned, and I drive with public safety in mind. I make sure that our community is safe, and make sure that we're delivering the highest level of professional services without any type of influence on the political front. And that will always be something that we will carry forward, and that will be something that I can guarantee as Sheriff of Maricopa County, and I've already proven throughout my career and currently as Sheriff with Maricopa County. I want to stay with you, Mr. Skinner. There are a lot of parents watching tonight, and there's a concern for the increasing problem of fentanyl in our communities. How do you think your office should be or the office at MCSO should be acting in relation to this uh, increasing problem? Well, I don't think as it should be. We are acting in reference to this problem. We actually have a, a group that's out of the opioid area within our office, uh, doing a lot of educational <clears throat> programs within the communities, but also on the fronts with uh, the county, the state, and the federal side to make sure that we're getting the education out 30 there. 30 seconds the education out there, as well as making sure that uh, we're being uh, on the forefront of it. We also have a lot of grant uh, programs that we're driving forward and making sure that we're getting and delivering those services of educational, but also the enforcement side of it. It's twofold. We need to make sure to prevent it, and we need to make sure to enforce it and make sure that we don't have it happen again. Mr. Kemps, how should this office should be acting in that regard? Uh, yeah, there's a couple ways that we can really curb uh, fentanyl uh, in, a, in our county. Uh, what I found through my years of experience investigating organized crime is uh, most of the fentanyl is, is coming across the border in, in different ways. Uh, if we can target the infrastructure uh, of these uh, distribution organizations, um, it causes a lot of problems for them because oftentimes the people that are bringing it across the border do not have the connection with the people that are selling it out of the houses. Um, so we can curb the problem by taking out some of the infrastructure. But I think more importantly than that, if we don't have a demand for fentanyl, then there won't be we, there, there'll be no need for a supply, and so uh, one of the things I like to do as sheriff is create a, a website, a public safety website that educates the public, uh, that provides resources to the public to safeguard your own families. The sheriff's office, the police departments can be everywhere all the time, and so I want to empower the public. We are all collectively responsible in safeguarding our families and public safety, and so by educating the public, teaching our public the latest trends with drugs, what fentanyl looks like what newer drugs called Trank looks like, seconds, what sir. it does to the body, what it, what it does to, uh, to families, that is critical and that's important. And so that's what I will do as sheriff is educate our, our community to safeguard their own, th themselves. Gentlemen, thank you both for a spirited debate. We appreciate it. <clears throat> now it's time for closing statements. Each of you have one minute. And to keep us on time, we'll politely cut you off if you run over. <laughs> Russ Skinner, you have the first closing statement. One minute, sir. Yes, well, thank you again to both of you. I appreciate being here today. <clears throat> as the sheriff of Maricopa County and with 34 years of, of experience, the past seven of them as the chief deputy under Paul Penzone, the leadership experience that I bring to the table, as well as knowing the staff, the community, and our, our challenges and our, we our weaknesses, challenges, and our strengths. I will continue to serve under the unique challenges of the sheriff's office, make sure that we make progress where we need to relative to the compliance efforts, <clears throat> standing reform, and make sure that we take care of the staff as well. Our service to our community is, is definitely the forefront. I think uh, we have come a long way over the last seven years, and I want to continue to drive that mission forward. Uh, standing in this position, I know every inch and every aspect of, of the agency as well as what is needed to get this done and provide the best level of public safety. So I thank you for the time. Mr. Uh, Kemp, you have the next closing statement. One minute. Yeah, who, who do you trust? Who do you trust? not to politicize the office and abuse its power? Who do you trust to fully comply and graduate from the federal court orders? Somebody who's worked for Joe Arpaio for 24 years and not once objected to his unconstitutional practices and policies? Somebody who's put in charge to comply with the court orders, failed to do so in 2016, resulting in a second order 
failing to do so again in 2022, resulting in a third court order. Or somebody with a fresh face and a fresh voice. Somebody with a proven track record of getting things done. Somebody with experience as a crime fighter, diplomatic experience working in countries overseas, and executive experience, a lifetime of experience building relationships with our nonprofit groups in our community. There is a reason why Mr. Skinner was appointed by the Republicans on the Board of Supervisors, and I was recruited by the Democratic Party. Organizations that fail to adapt you to change seconds, are dead already. My name is Tyler Camp, and I'd be honored to have your vote as the next sheriff of Maricopa County. Well, this wraps today's debate with the Democratic candidates for Maricopa County Sheriff. As a reminder, the Arizona primary election is July 30th and early voting starts July 3rd. All registered voters can participate in that primary, including independents. There are a lot of offices up for election this year, so we'll keep hosting debates through the November general election. Head to azmedia.org to see a list of every local media partner, plus upcoming debates, and where you can find them on TV, radio, and digital platforms. You can also see the full debate schedule, learn more about clean elections, and submit questions for future debates by heading to azcleanelections.gov. On behalf of our partners at Clean Elections, the Arizona Media Association, Reister, and Bitfire Studios, thanks for joining us.